when you're, when you're involved with the Adventist movement in the world. Uh, we're a wonderful movement. 95% of our members are outside of North America. Uh, we're just a small group. I mean, I've stood in front of thousands of people in India and other places. Lots and lots, and most of our brothers and sisters are outside the United States. Anyway, uh, we were going to go. Uh, Dr. Clarence Singh and Dr. Brian Lenzer, they're the Armenians that wanted to go back to their roots and, and do a meeting. Uh, and about a week before, or two weeks before, I went to a large Adventist gathering called ASI. I think it was in Sacramento. And after the worship service, they um, have lunch. And so there are about 1,000, 2,000 people there, and they're all in line waiting for lunch. And then they, they channel you to seats, and then you eat. And it's a good, good time to meet new friends. We were going down this line. All these people were around, and they just heard you like sheep. And I got, and my then wife got placed at a table next to a man named Ted Wilson. Now, at that time, Ted Wilson was president of the Review and Herald. He is today president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. But then we, we sat there, and we introduced ourselves, and we were around the table, and, you know, who are you? What, what are you doing? Um, turns out, we told him, we're two weeks away from going to Armenia, but we don't have an official invitation from the church brethren. We want to be official. We want to be in the bosom of the church. And he pulled open the fly leaf of his Bible, and he had a little piece of paper, because it turns out Ted Wilson had been president of the Trans-European Division based in Moscow. He had been to Armenia several times. He knew the leadership. He knew the structure. And he said, right here is Vladimir Sajin. Here's his email address. You email him and say that I t suggested that he invite you. I did, and within three days, I had an invitation from the head of the church and the Transcaucasus Union to come to Armenia, and he would have somebody meet at the airport. We went, we did a meeting. The two Armenian guys went up to one city, and, and an Adventist nurse and my then wife, Gail, went to a different city. We held meetings, we had 29 baptisms. We were headed home. And if you know anything about Ar Armenian history, and a lot of people don't, but in fact, Armenians were, have been persecuted highly in history. In 1910 to 1915, there was a genocide and over a million Armenians were either killed or driven through the Syrian desert to death. So there is a big memorial, the most prominent place in Yerevan, Armenia, called the Genocide Memorial. Big monuments and an eternal flame and all the, all the monuments are marked with uh, memorials to the Armenians that were massacred in 1915 in, in, in Armenia. And uh, in those days, they didn't have air service every day, so they, they were leaving Armenia three days a week. I had two days to spend waiting for the next flight. And so we went to the memorial. I stood there, I remember, with other people walking around looking at all the monuments. And I stood there. It was the end of September. And so there was snow on Mount Ararat across in Turkey, and there was snow all over the mountains of Armenia. And I, I prayed. I mean, I'd been busy doing meetings. We didn't have any time to, to go to restaurants or even go hiking, hardly. Uh, we were busy doing stuff, working up the people for baptism. And I prayed, Lord, we're here in the mountains of Armenia. I never thought I'd be here. Here I am, because... I was invited to, do, to, to arrange the meetings. And I said, Lord, the Bible says the ark landed in the mountains of Armenia. I'm standing right here in the middle of the mountains of Armenia. There is Ararat. And there are all the other mountains of Armenia. The ark landed here somewhere. Where did it land? That was a simple prayer, spontaneous prayer, not pre-planned. And not written, but out of my heart, standing there at the genocide memorial. Well, one thing led to another, and in time, the Lord answered that prayer. And that is the reason why, over the last 18, 17 years, I've been to Armenia 20 times. Norma has been there, she tells me, 10 times. Uh, I think it's more like seven, but we've been there a lot. 
And the Lord has answered that prayer. I don't have time here today to, to tell you the whole story. Um, I sent a girl for a summer to the UCLA library to research their holdings. There are more books on Armenia at the UCLA library than there are in the nation of Armenia. Uh, there are more Armenians in California than there are in Armenia. So she went down and she brought back copies from books. And that was the beginning of a search to, to simplify it. Uh, Danielle, did we get the, the uh, PowerPoint going? Yeah. Are you ready? Uh, why don't you try the first one? I, I didn't see no, the... We already did. Uh, is the text on it? Yeah. Okay. Can you show that? All right. See, there's, there's no text in it. Um, no, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's just a difference between keynote and PowerPoint and some issues of compatibility. Anyway, this is, this is a quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy. The simple first answer to prayer was that I consulted, like I do before preaching the sermon, I'll, I'll go to the Bible, and then I'll go to the Spirit of Prophecy for support, for quotations, for inspiration. And chapter 8 of Patriarchs and Prophets has a literal description by Ellen White of the topography of the landing site of Noah's Ark. Uh, and I'll quote it. She says that, that at, at, at day 150, which is the time when God remembered Noah according to Genesis, the Lord caused the ark to move to a place surrounded by a group of mountains not far apart, and that for the rest of the time of the floodwaters, the ark moved around in that quiet haven, first resting against one peak and then against another until it landed, stuck in the mud, and the whole sequence of the angel uh, opening the, the door and the, the animals coming out occurred. Well. That description in the spirit of prophecy of the topography is exactly what um, the topography of Mount Aragat is in Armenia. Um, it is a four-peak mountain. Uh, Marco Polo went through there in the year 1200. It was described to him as a cube, which is exactly what it is. Uh, and it's, it's a cube surrounded by, by a, what's sometimes called a crater. Uh, by an area that during the, the time of the flood would have been a quiet haven away from the turbulence of the open ocean. So it meets the description. Um, uh, and that was the reason that I started doing expeditions in Armenia. I've probably done a dozen. I've taken over 10 Americans and, and used 10 Armenians. There are about 1,200 Seventh-day Adventists in Armenia. Uh, there are 15 churches. And frankly, most Armenians are trying to get out of Armenia and come to Glendale. I mean, that's, that's the pathway, um, including the Adra leader who I knew in Armenia. Uh, she left, we, when, our first time there this year, we went to church. And I looked for Anoush, who was head of Adra last year. And, oh, Anoush has gone to Glendale. Well, you know, it's the pathway out. She needs to get a green card, she needs to do this. But anyway, um, there is a national, uh, uh, there's a museum in, in Yerevan of Matros Sarian, who was the, the, the painter of Armenia. He, uh, he, his, he lived in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. You go to the museum and there's a lot of pictures, including many of Aragats. Aragats is the second highest mountain in the Caucasus. Uh, it's substantially less uh, tall than than, than Ararat, but that's a different story. That's why I, I made sure that, that the reading was of the mountains of Armenia, because the, and we're not gonna deal with all of the false sightings and claims about Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat is a singular volcanic cone located in Turkey that didn't exist a thousand years ago. There's the, the best research on creation science in the club is uh, Ken Ham and uh, Answers in Genesis, based in Kentucky. They have a replica of the Ark. They have the Creation Museum in Cincinnati. And they have a lot of good geologists. They, they've done the best geology, the best archaeology, 
relating to the, to, to the flood. And their, their number one geologist named Snelly says, and it's totally true, that Mount Ararat in Turkey uh, didn't exist more than 1,000 years ago, probably 800 years ago. The reason that all of the Western folks have gone there is because Turkey was open, the iron, behind the Iron Curtain was closed. Uh, they're just beginning to think about going east from Mount Ararat. In fact, in their recent magazine, they debunked all the stories, all the claims about Mount Ararat and said maybe, maybe it's east in Armenia. They happen to be right, but they're not there. We were there. The Adventists have been there for 100 years. Adventist uh, uh, folks came back from America, evangelized Armenia. Armenia is tough territory because they have a Orthodox church. The Armenian Apostolic Church has a patriarch, and they own the country. When I, when I did my meeting in the third city in Armenia, the opening night we had, we had a huge crowd in the largest uh, uh, venue in, in uh, Kirov Khan. And the next night we came back. We were on TV that first night. We had just a tremendous response. The police were there, and they had a chain, and they said, you can't get in because the minister of religion has turned this meeting off. You're not official, you're not proper. I mean, they, they guard their territory, and, and uh, you know, Adventists are, are careful and uh, oppressed, and there's a lot of, of public evangelism. But I made the correspondence early on between the paintings that I saw of Aragats and the description of the topography in the spirit of prophecy. And that led to a number of expeditions. They were all field expeditions, climbing expeditions. And the, the great difficulty we had was that it would take four hours to get up to the site. We could have two or three hours, and then you have to get off the mountain before the, the thunderstorms start in the afternoon. So it was a lot of hiking, a lot of work, and a little exploration. Well, four years ago, we started using drones. And we didn't have to physically go everywhere. We could be on the South Peak and commandeer the drone. We could, we could depend a magnetometer from a drone. Uh, and the biggest thing, I, was, I wanted to buy a helicopter. I researched it, my paralegal started taking flying lessons, but it, it, it costs you, it would cost you 500 grand to buy the helicopter, at least. And it would cost you 100 grand to maintain it at minimum. So it's a, it's a big deal. And I never put it together. Uh, and then a rich Armenian started a helicopter company. When we first went there, there were only a few Russian helicopters there, these big old MI machines that you know, are for troops. And uh, we, we took a ride once, and we came out to the tarmac with, a, with dash cans, and they were, they were fueling the plane. I mean, it was pretty primitive stuff. And, but we did it. What happened that has changed our expedition is that uh, a rich Armenian who, who made his money in some of the stands in Tur Turkmenistan or somewhere, uh, and he's a patriot, and he started a helicopter company. He has four Airbus helicopters. We took them last year. We took about 12, 14 rides last year, this year 15. And there's a difference between hiking for four hours, getting to your site of examination, and getting on a helicopter and being there in 35 minutes. I mean, it's, 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 it's like uh, Star Trek and getting on the machine and, and having them transport you there. I mean, it changed the whole game. C can you go maybe to, to the third picture? Forget about this. Put the microphone on your phone. Okay. There we go. That is a helicopter we've taken, uh, or our, I and my people have taken. Uh, 20 times, 25 times, and it, it has made the whole difference. Our prayers now are that the guy doesn't die and, and, and that he close the business uh, because it has made, he has, he has $3 million of equipment for Air, Airbus helicopters. He, he's, never, he's, he's made his profit from having the toilet paper market in Uzbekistan. He sells all the toilet paper in Uzbekistan. He's got a big factory, and if you're going to buy toilet paper there, 
you got to buy his toilet paper. So he's got his money, and he's an Armenian patriot. He, he, he has served the military when they were fighting Azerbaijan, and there would be military casualties. They would fly there to the war zone, take them back to the hospitals in Yerevan. They did it 50 times. They saved many, many lives. And I said, uh, and, and they're doing it on their own resources. They're paying for it. And I said, how can you afford it? Well, they can't, except he's selling all this toilet paper. Um, and he's a hero to the Armenian military. Uh, and to the hero to me, I said, how, why are you doing this? And he said, I'm a patriot. He did it, you know, because it's his country. And believe me, they're out, outgunned and, and by the oil money from Azerbaijan. Anyway, I stood there with him this year, and we're standing there. He's, you know, he, he, he's a zillionaire. He looks like he's pretty well fed and pretty, pretty well satisfied with his life. And I asked him, um, I told him what we were doing. You know, he, here we are, we're probably their best customer this year. It cost about two grand per ride, and we took 15 of them. Uh, he wants to know, what, what are we doing? We're always flying from the heliport to Aragats to the crater, and then staying there three days, five days, 10 days, and coming back. I told him we're looking for Noah's Ark. We think historically from Marco Polo, from Josephus, uh, and I, he, he wouldn't know Ellen White from anybody, but uh, we believe, because we're standing right there, you look this way, and there's Mount Ararat in Turkey. You look the other way, there's Mount Aragats in Armenia. And I said, we believe, we, we have reason to believe that uh, the ark landed there, and if it's God's will, there is some remnant of it, and we are looking for it. And he stood there and he said, you know, I think you're right. They haven't found it on Mount Ararat, and they've looked, and there's lots of information I can, you know, uh, belabor you with that. Suffice it to say, we were in Armenia because of Adventist evangelism. We have gone back to Armenia because the Lord has opened doors. We're, we're a uh, nonprofit in the state of Hawaii. And it says the reason for this nonprofit is to validate the landing site of Noah's Ark in the nation of Armenia. We're a 501c3 in the United States. The U.S. tax people will let us take donations, and it's tax deductible. So every dollar we spend uh, is tax deductible. And we are, th this is the most amazing thing to me, we're an NGO in the nation of Armenia. You know, we are registered with the government to be there to do this exploration to, for the purpose of validating the landing site of Noah's Ark in the nation of Armenia. And four years ago, uh, they decided they were going to clean up their books and get rid of a lot of NGOs. They had French and German and English and other entities coming to Armenia to help AIDS orphans and, and hunger and all kinds of things. And they somehow had this nationalistic idea that all these foreigners were corrupting their society and we had to get rid of them all. So they started squeezing the NGOs, including us, and demanding money, demanding taxes. You know, uh, you can imagine a tax collector in a totalitarian society with all the power and, and authority and attitude about squeezing people. They can be tough. They're not Russian, they're Armenian, but they learn from the KGB. I mean, they, anyway, they tried to squeeze us for money and they wanted real money, big money. Uh, and we have an Armenian guy, uh, um, Seventh-day Adventist, who was fighting for us then. He'd go down there and he'd, you know, the building was locked and it was, you know, they were armed and, you know, they were not popular people in the society, uh, the tax collecting people in Armenia. And finally, after a number of hard negotiations with them, They said to him, go find it, and we will leave you alone. And we actually had an, an interaction with the office of the president, and I'm going to share with you as we close. We don't have time to even scratch this, the surface here, but these, these guys and all the Armenians that we met, you know, they're patriotic, they're nationalistic, they care about their, their culture, their language, you know, everything they are. And uh, they want it to happen. I mean, they're not... They're not trying to, to make it not happen. Um, and that just, 
what I'm trying to say is that we wouldn't be doing this and continue to do it if the Lord didn't keep opening the doors. He opened the doors. And I say, Lord, you don't want us to do it. You just close it. But he has opened it. And I can uh, just, the motivation that I have comes from what it would mean. Uh, and I'm going to show you what we found this year. I mean, that, uh, I, I think that'll show on, on our pictures here. Um, we were in Fremont, California at an REI store. We were getting ready for an expedition four years ago. It was a big one. It was our biggest one. We had 27 people, 17 porters, Armenian kids from the village, five Americans, five Armenians, three cooks. It was a mess. And the beauty of the helicopter, we only have to take two or three people, five people. We have to take our gear. This, this is our gear. We got to this place. Our, our other next door neighbors didn't come. But he saw me putting this in our vehicle and taking it to the airport. We left Bishop with 13 luggages, you, can, you know, when they were flying with the United. And we took him down there and we wondered, are we going to get out of Bishop with all of our stuff? And, you know, all we had to do was pay him. They wanted money. You know, so much, oh, this, this, this all cost you 250 bucks. You know, that'll, you know, and we paid him and they were happy and it made its way to, to, to Yerevan. Um, but at the hotel, I'm, I'm going to go back to REI, but at the hotel, uh, we were having some material facts somewhere, I think, and I had written up some material, uh, and, and this gal who was faxing it was reading it, and she said, is this true? Is this, could this really be true? I mean, the, the impact on the human heart uh, of a valid, I mean, there, we are so richly blessed with understanding. I grew up in Sunday school. You know, I learned my, 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 my Bible verses in Sunday school. I went through catechism. Uh, you have grown up in the Adventist church or the Catholic church. We are blessed with the knowledge, but 90% of Americans don't know the first thing about the Bible or about God. And the, 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 we were at REI, and I had like four guys with me. They're all young, and they're all healthy, and they're kind of kind of rambunctious, we were buying. They had an open ticket to buy any gear they needed. So, so they were getting, you know, jackets and, and uh, whatever you can imagine. If you could go into REI and get anything you wanted. And this checker girl was saying, what are you guys doing? How can, you know, we, we had spent $2,000 and the, the, the ticket was running. And um, one of the guys, you know, they, 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 they were not, uh, Diplomatic, they just, oh, we're looking for Noah's Ark. And she said, what? I mean, and she, what? You know, she, the, the, it was incredulous to her that standing, you know, reasonably normal-looking human beings would be telling them that they're going somewhere looking for Noah's Ark. I mean, that sounds like a cartoon or, or a crazy movie or something. And, the, and then she said, Oh, I have a girlfriend. She goes to the such and such a church over here. I'm going to tell her. But, I mean, she didn't have any religious life. She didn't have any experience or any knowledge. But she had a girlfriend who would go, who would go to church. She had to tell her something was going on. So there is a class of people. You know, we're going to the ends of the earth and sharing the gospel <coughs> and doing it through the media. But there is a, there is a group of people right among us who don't know a thing, who have no sense, no sense of this, the joy of, of worshiping or, or, or having a relationship with God. You know, they know nothing. And, and I mean the knowledge, just the, the, you know, why would you come and sit in the pew like this? Why would you be here instead of being up on the trail? And I know some Adventists in my family, you know, their, their worship consists of taking a hike you know, they haven't been in a real worship service for a long time. And they justify it. Well, we're out in nature, you know. There's the sky and, you know, here's the, here's the trails and here are the trees. And so we're communing with God, but they have drifted away from God. So there is a, we're doing this. We're, I'm going to share with you here. In the, there's, can you go to the next one? Can you, can you advance it? There was our, our campsite this year. In the crater, we're about 10,500 feet 
Uh, we're under the saddle between the north peak on the left and the east peak on the right. Can you go to the next one? That's the, uh, where the runoff from the glacier goes down between the south peak and the east peak. We think, and if you're standing there, I think you would think so as well, that's where the animals came out. They couldn't have come off of Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat's a volcanic cylinder cone. And unless you had, what did you call it? Unless you could rappel down the mountainside. That's a giraffe could use ropes. Yeah, a giraffe could you, have to use ropes to get down Mount Ararat. But here, here, there, there, we're, we're somewhere adjacent the, 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 the runoff. There is a, a pathway. I, I hiked it. I didn't, I didn't like it. I, I'm not a climber like you. Uh, I'm not a hiker. Uh, I don't like it. I'm only doing it because the Lord led me there. And we're following. He can close it tomorrow. Um, but we're going to do it until, until the end. And I believe we're very near the end. This year, so what we've we done with the helicopter, we can take stuff we couldn't take, uh, even with porters. We had 17 porters. We, we had a drill, a pneumatic drill. We, were, we could go down about 20 feet. And we had a drill string. We had sections of this stainless steel stuff. So each porter carried one or two sections of the string. And there w the instructions were, if you're losing your load on the narrow trail, get rid of your load. Save your life. Don't, don't go down with the load. Let the piece go. And so when we, we lost a piece of our drill string. Uh, now, we, we could take gear. And why don't you go to the next, next slide? One more advancement. Last. Did something to you? Well, last year at Christmas time, we went to New Orleans to the American Geophysical Union. It's where all the people looking for gold and looking for copper and, 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 and stuff go to, to sell their wares. Uh, and uh, we bought this gear. It's made in France. It's called electrical resistivity tomography. You, uh, you drive stakes in the ground, and you tie it to the cable. And every uh, so many meters, there is a, a way to access the cable. And you have a, you have a, a length of line that's uh, 175 meters. That's long enough to pick up the arc. Uh, and you have this in the ground, and you, and you run the main unit, and it sends electrical signals in the ground, and it gives you data of what is in the ground, down to about 70 feet, okay? Okay, do you, you see the line there, the yellow line, or orange line? That's, that's one of these lengths of cable, and there were three of them together, so you would, you would get 36 uh, points of uh, electrical impulse and electrical reception, and you would get data. The thing, thing crunches away, and we brought back data. We had it uh, analyzed at Rutgers University in, in New Jersey uh, by the guy who runs a company called SGS, Subsurface Geophysical Solutions. And just two weeks ago, we got, our, we got our data back. Can you go to the next one? That was, that was the, uh, the map of the, of the crater. We had three clusters. We, we basically spent about... 20 days on the site, and we, we did runs in, in three major areas. Uh, go, go one more. Okay, that, that is a cross-section of what is in the ground down to about 50 feet. Uh, there's nothing here. That's just dirt. The, the colors, the yellows, the, the rust color, uh, the green is just, uh, I, I call it muck. It probably uh, is topsoil that came down from, from uh, uh, one, one or more of the peaks, but go to the next one. Okay, that, the year before, so about a year and a half ago, uh, we had a magnetometer uh, that we, we ran systematically over the bottom of the crater, and we picked up what we thought was a signal of a linear structure subsurface, and that's why we went back this year to that place so we, we had a general idea. We have that data, but I don't, I don't have it here. And, and about 
eight of our runs were right over this, this structure. And that blue is, in geophysical terms, an anomaly. An anomaly. Its electrical resistivity is different than the background. And while it's not, um, you know, we're, we're at some angle to it. We don't quite, quite know, and we don't know. It's not, it's, it's just a, it's, my, my son calls it a big blob. But it's a blob that shouldn't be there. There shouldn't be anything in that ground. That's just dirt, and it's at 10,500 feet. Uh, so we are told by, by our, our uh, analyst, he's a professor of geophysics at Rutgers University, that the, the depth of the top of the blue is, five, uh, is one to five meters. In other words, it's, it's very near the surface of the ground. It's very easy to get to. We don't have to go down 30 feet, 50 feet. We just need to dig or use a probe. And we didn't know this until a couple of weeks ago. They've been crunching the data. Uh, the other guy that went to Armenia had the logbook, and he, he stayed in Armenia for six weeks afterwards. So anyway, we're at a place now where we are we're timed out. The weather has changed. We can't go back this season. There's always been a time window of, of uh, two to three months when you can be there. It's, it's changed with the helicopter, but I don't think the helicopter will even fly now up there uh, because of the risks of, of, of weather. Anyway, um, we are motivated because what I have seen in the, in the eyes and, and, and reactions of people who don't know anything. I mean, first of all, I believe that every one of us here accepts the Bible as true. You accept there was a flood. I mean, in, 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 in science, I mean, we haven't even talked to our, our scientific guys about religion, but I suspect they don't believe there was a flood. Um, they don't have to, they just have to analyze data. Um, but we do, and if we find an object or a piece of the object, you know how, how big it is, it's, it's a huge, big, it was a huge, big structure, and uh, we don't know, we, we, we have no knowledge, no certainty, but we have a path to where we are, and we're the only game in town. There have been dozens of expeditions to Turkey, to Mount Ararat. Uh, the only people that are thinking the thoughts that we're thinking are other Adventists in, in Armenia that we've taken to the mountain. And they're kind of copycats. You can, I can take you to a church in Armenia where they claim that they have found stuff, but they don't have the technology that we do. They don't have the money. They, they are... Uh, poor and, 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 and wannabe claimants. We've never made claims. We've never raised money. We've totally self-funded. I like a quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy, Ellen White. Talks about Noah. That he spent all that he had building the ark. He didn't have a crowd me, you know, a mechanism of raising funny, you know, money on the internet. And he didn't uh, run around. There is an Adventist guy who's dead now who, who was quite active in... in talking and raising money and making claims. Uh, I don't want to knock the dead, but uh, he's in, in, incredible. Uh, I have resisted going to the big guys, the Ken Ham, if you know who Ken Ham is, or the ICR people in Dallas, Texas. Um, they wouldn't accept the spirit of prophecy. I mean, that was my motivation. That was my pathway to get where, where, where we are today. Uh, most of the people that have gone with us were either Adventist pastors or people who accepted the spirit of prophecy. I almost took an Adventist guy from Iceland who was a geology student, and I could start talking to him, and, and he didn't, he wasn't sure there was a, a universal flood, and uh, I don't think he would have accepted the spirit of prophecy. So it just didn't, it didn't work. The people that have gone with us are people who believe they think there's something to find. We think there's something to find. And I think next year is going to be the proof of this particular situation. Um, and I, I'm not going to go much farther, but I'm going to suggest three things. I'm going to ask Norma to tell, tell one thing. Um, what do we do next? Okay. Uh, 
If we were a month earlier, we might go back this year. But uh, the weather on Aragats, you know, how we have our first snow, well, the same thing happens on Aragats. And the helicopters will, won't fly, I think. We have three pathways we can follow. One, we can go back to the government. If we have access to the office of the president, uh, they've got a lot of problems. I mean, they have Azerbaijan. They've got a war with Azerbaijan. They have... And one of the reasons we brought back our guy is that the country is flooded with Russians now. All these men are leaving Russia to avoid the draft. So you walk the streets of Yerevan, and you can, you can, I can look at these guys. He's a Russian. He's a Russian. He's a Russian man. That they, they have left Russia to, to avoid the draft. Hotel room rates have gone up by 50%. We used to stay at a place for so much, and our, we were paying more. But the government is open. And, and he's not, not a Christian that we know, um, but he's a patriot, and he's an intelligent man. He was a journalist. So we have access. When we went there a few years ago, uh, we gave him our material, and the word that came back was, go do your thing and come back if you need help. So we haven't had to go back because nobody's ever bothered us. I mean, there, there are no bad guys around. I mean, it's so far up the mountain. Normally, to get there, you know, you've got to spend a day, and you've got to be an alpinist. And we hired some of them, and, and, and we don't have to do it anymore. So our, our, our best hope is that the helicopter guy doesn't die. Um, so the second thing we can do, and I have the names of the people, the uh, head of the Department of Archaeology and Geology at Yerevan State University, who would be the technical people uh, who could pass on it, but almost certain in the Soviet system they're not believers. So I haven't tried it, but that's a pathway. The third pathway is just to go do it. We own property there. Why don't you come up, Norma? We own three parcels of property. We have a structure. We stored a lot of our gear there. And we have a tent. It's called an uh, expedition tent. It's not just a, it's a, it's a big, big tent. It'll, it'll, and it's not really used to sleep in. It's used to eat in, and it's used to gather in. And we've had Sabbath worship services in it. Uh, and if we put that tent over the site where we want to dig, we can dig and nobody will know what we're doing. And that's what we might do. So we have a practical approach. We have a technical approach with the scientists in the Yerevan and a political approach. I, 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 like, of those, I like best the practical. The next best the political. I mean, these guys are patriots and they're in a hard place. I mean, Armenia is a hard, hard neighborhood. So anyway, what are we going to do with our property? Or what do we want to do? Um, well, we own a piece of property in Jirakan. It's a village on the slopes of air jets. And it could be used as a, a museum. If anything is found in the future, then it could be a, uh, a museum could be put there. Uh, and Obviously, in the museum, there would be displays, but also a model. You know how sometimes when you go to somewhere like Yosemite or, or a national park, they'll have a large uh, topographical display. So it would be nice to have a large topographical, um, dis not just topographical, but um, a, a model of Mount Aragats. Because as he mentioned, Mount Aragats is like a little cube. There are four peaks. Two of them, uh, the highest is, uh, I think, 13.4, and then there's the one that's like 13, about 3, and then two are 12.4 and 12.3, so it's just a little cluster, right in a little, so it's like a little cup, and that's a perfect place for uh, a per protection of something like the Ark. So that type of a display would be very graphic and lead people to understand why that's such an ideal place for the Ark. Ellen White says that these group, this group of mountains, you can go to chapter 8 of Patriarchs and Prophets, and she says, at day 150 of the flood, see, Noah was out there in the open ocean. There was turbulence. There was, it, was, it was nasty. It was smell. He talked about, somebody was talking about smell today. I think that was Ken. That was the funeral home orientation about the, the dead bodies. But anyway, you can think of all the fecal matter and all the stuff that was happening on the ark. Uh, must not have been a uh, you know, an easy place to live. But the Spirit of Prophecy says that Noah and his family were frightened for their lives because of all of the 
you know, the noises and sounds and, 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 and violence on the op open ocean. But after 150 days, they were in this quiet haven, just smoothly s sailing about. So um, the point is that God, she says, those, that structure was preserved by his power. It was pre-flood. It didn't just get thrust up like these mountains did here by the flood. It was created and it was preserved and it didn't get destroyed in the flood and it was there waiting for the ark to be brought in and to sail around inside. So it should... Go ahead. Well, Marco Polo traveled through Armenia about the year 1200 from Italy to China. In those days, the, the trade route went through Ani. It's a city that was a, a big city in, in Armenia. They collected tolls and in his book, Travels, he uh, describes the mountain that the ark landed on as a cube, which is exactly what this is. Um, it's a cube. Daryl has a copy of our book. Uh, we just shared it with him somewhere along the way. Um, go ahead. There's also, like, when you go to one of the largest bookstores in Yerevan, Yerevan is the capital of Armenia, uh, they have a children's book, and, and they have a stylized drawing. It's just uh, the cover of the book, a stylized uh, drawing of Aragats, Mount Aragats. So they have, you know, when you do something stylized, it's, they have these four little points, you know, it's just so, so interesting. It's just definitely showing how Aragats is this little, little cone, sh little cube shaped haven, like a little harbor. It's almost like a perfect harbor. Preserved by his power, which is a much different idea than just a random descent to a cylindrical cone sitting out there, which wasn't even there. I mean, if you want to, the best work on, on this uh, subject is done by the evangelicals. Unfortunately, Adventists have Geoscience Research Institute at Loma Linda, right across from the medical school, and they have a budget from the GC, and they do some stuff, but it's, it's uh, inferior to what they're doing in Texas at ICR, Institute for Creation Research, or in Kentucky and, and, and Ohio. Um, what's that? Oh, well, I, I thought Aaron Rodriguez might be here today, but her father was Seventh-day Adventist pastor, assistant to uh, the president of the North American Division, and his father was an Adventist pastor who was working with George Vandeman, who raised... Uh, a couple million dollars, and he sent people to Mount Ararat. You know, they didn't, and they had a pathway to get there, and they were wrong, and and uh, it hasn't been found because everybody mostly is looking in the wrong place. As far as I know, it's only Seventh Day Adventists that have been on Aragat. So that's what we're doing. Uh, we're going back probably in the next couple of months to do uh, some some pre work and and, and just make decisions on on what to do next year, but. I'll, I'll just close with this. I, I happen, we had at our local church in Hayward uh, different evangelistic programs. We had John Bradshaw twice. We were lucky when he was still with Amazing Facts. And so I, I'm a friend and we, we, we met for dinner. He was passing through. He's a you know, wonderful TV speaker and, and doing great things. We were sitting there. He, he, he knew, knows what we're doing. And I said, John, wouldn't it be, if God wanted this to happen, if, and we're not saying that he does, we're saying if, if he wanted it to happen, would he not want a Seventh-day Adventist to do it? Today, you know, his people are going to be prominent. We're going to be prominent in not a very good way, but, uh, but we are. And would he not have been, we don't know. He said, he said his answer to me was, I hope so. I hope so. So, so we will see. Um, we are... Continuing, and I, I can tell you other personal reasons, but wh why we're doing it. But believe me, our life would be a thousand times easier if we just took our retirement and spent our money and traveled around and did whatever we wanted to do. Um, but we feel this is a calling that has not yet been taken away from us. It is, it is ongoing. Uh, but the weather closes it off because we're talking about digging. We're talking about uh, going from that top surface down to the blue. What is the blue? Does the blue have an edge 
We're looking for an edge, and not just a blob like my son says. Uh, and you, you can't, from this kind of uh, technology, you can't really, you just know something is there, and it's pretty good size, and it shouldn't be anything there. We're, t we're talking, uh, you know, uh, there shouldn't be any structure there at all unless, unless it's floated in, unless it meets the criteria of, of, a, uh, um, of an arc. Um, what he's saying about it would be easier just not to go, it is like when you travel, when you go to Armenia, it's, let's see, San Francisco to Doha, 14 hours, and then from there to Yerevan, Armenia, another three hours. But you know how when you travel, it's not, you don't, it's just not the travel time. Sitting in the airport for three hours, sitting in the next airport for X number of hours, so it takes about 23 hours to get there. You know, and I just thought, this is the first time this has ever been shared. I mean, we, we've only had that picture for two weeks. I had the data, I had the raw data, I had a data file. Uh, I'm not a PC guy, that's why we're having all this problem here with a Mac versus PC. And we've got a PC somewhere, maybe it's, it's where you're sitting. Uh, but we had this, this raw data file, you know, three to five megabytes of numbers, you know, that it means something when you t put it, tie it in with the program uh, that turns the numbers into visual data. So we only had this, this I've had this physically since September. Um, but uh, we've only had it in, in this form for, for, for about two weeks. And we've missed this season. I don't think we're going back this year. And, so we are going back next year. And also air gas, uh, mount, mountain people here would be interested. Because of just the way it's situated and there's the four peaks and it's, it's by itself, it makes its own weather. It makes some very bad weather. Uh, you wouldn't expect it necessarily with something, you know, these are not super high mountains, but because it's in that cube shape and it's out there kind of sitting by itself, it, it, it can make very bad weather, in the, especially in the afternoon. Very, you know, lots of lightning, it can have hail, just, it can, and it can come up very quickly and it can be extremely Well, bad, pe people die. Uh, I spent a night on the mountain with five other guys about 10 years ago, and it was a light, full of lightning all night, just splashing back and forth and around. And, and I was never so scared in my life, and these guys weren't either. The next morning at daylight, they picked up everything, and this one Armenian guy, you know what a lavash is? Lavash is Armenian bread. It's flat bread. We had a big, a big uh, cake of, of Ar and he was make, making sure he got that back to civilization, so he humped up the mountain with this big with this pack and this big thing of lavash on his back, and he was carrying, I don't know how many pounds, lots and lots of pounds. So one, one year, this is about five years ago, the day before we came, somebody was killed by lightning. He was just standing on the, on the pass going up to the uh, South Pass. He was on the, on the way up, and a lightning bolt just came out of the sky. There were no clouds. You know, lightning travels laterally, and if you're the, the point of electrical whatever, it just hits you, <laughs> and it's all over. So. And then three years ago, I guess a Polish tourist was killed there by a bear. But fortunately, it wasn't in the crater. I knew, I mean, I knew it wasn't going to be in the crater because no bear is going to come up there. There's nothing there for him to scavenge. But, yeah, anyway, we are not raising money. We've never asked for money. We've never been offered money. We haven't received money. Um, the Lord has provided. The Lord is the best. I used to, uh, you know, I was self-employed. He's the best paymaster there is. He takes care of you better than any other person would ever take care of you. So, uh, what? Yeah. There's where we are. So Marcos once asked, and so that's an answer to Marcos' question. And, and Mike has asked, and Summer knew a little bit about it. Um, and here's, here's my, my sense. I saw out there in the hallway, there's a picture of uh, HMS Richards with Kenny as a little boy, you know, they had some series here or something. He is an esteemed hero in the Adventist church. And then I see the little, the little uh, uh, letter on the wall as you come in where the wife of um, Eric B. Hare came out of this church. So I think it's okay for this place to uh, be the first place in the world that we're sharing this idea. And there's, it's TBD, to be determined where we are by next, we're going to go earlier next year, and we know where we're going. Uh, 
one of the problems we've had in some past expeditions, we went somewhat late. Two years ago, we had a, a drone pilot from Germany we were hiring. He brought his, his drone and his magnetometer. And uh, his wife was from Africa, and she wanted to go on vacation, so he couldn't come until August. We wanted to go in July, so we really want the time window optimally to be early, and then you can do it again and again if you need to. Anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, it's been a little uh, jumbled, but that's that picture uh, to us has, has some meaning, and there shouldn't be anything there. It should all be dirt. It should all be a blob. Father in heaven, you are love. Your son is returning to this world to establish your kingdom here with permanence and with certainty and with promptness. We ask that we would be ready and willing to meet you at that time. And I pray that the Bishop Seventh-day Adventist Church would represent you we thank you for the presence of our guest, Heidi Doherty, today. And we ask that you would open the net for the kingdom, that it would draw all to you, 
all who are sincere, all who are your children, created in your image and willing to follow you fully. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.